David, beyond crypto, we've seen valuations come down considerably in the public and private market. I'm just curious, looking at 2023, where is Apollo looking to deploy capital? It's a good question. Um, you know, if you like buying stuff cheap, and that's, I think, what we like to do, that's what all investors should like to do, there's certainly more cheap stuff now than there was a year ago, so we're quite excited about uh, the deal environment. However, there's not a lot of debt financing available. So for firms like ourselves that have shown our, our ability to finance deals when they're tough and banks are hung with still $55 billion of debt and the spigot for financing, which is the lifeblood of our industry, is quite uh, clogged. Um, we've shown an ability, whether it's the Atlas Air transaction, which we announced, uh, one of the first two transactions in our 10th private equity fund, where we finance 70% of the purchase price ourselves. Um, this creativity around sourcing around structuring is really going to be key uh, for 2023, in my opinion. And that's going to be the theme for deploying capital. How can you get a deal done in a market where financing is really very hard to come by? Yeah, you've also grown a really robust travel and hospitality portfolio from taking Atlas Air Private, acquiring the Venetian in Las Vegas last year, even investment in Scandinavian Airlines. Just curious, your reaction to what happened this morning, the FAA grounding all flights across the U.S. When you see something like that play out, does that change your investment thesis for this industry in this year? You know, we're still trying to figure out exactly what happened today. I listened to your last guest right before I came on. I'm sure there'll be a thorough investigation. Thank goodness it was just a very short delay. Uh, I say that personally because I actually flew home last night, uh, and I'm glad I did and I wasn't caught up in this. Um, I do think long term the question of uh, information technology systems, whether it's in the travel and leisure space or in really any industry we look at, is table stakes from a due diligence perspective. There is a lot of antiquated software out there in America, and from a risk and also an opportunity standpoint, it's something we spend a ton of time focused on. We've got a great team internally. We have an internal operations team that partners with our deal teams uh, to help us do diligence these things. And, and it's something that, frankly, we didn't spend as much time on 10 years ago. And it really is fundamental to, to basically every investment we make, regardless of what industry, but of course, also in the travel and leisure industry. You know, one quick example, you mentioned the Venetian. Uh, we bought the Venetian. You wouldn't think it's necessarily the most complicated uh, property or investment to have. It's a hotel and casino in one location in the Las Vegas uh, market, the largest hotel in America, 7,100 rooms, uh, 2.3 million square feet of convention space, had very, very, very old uh, technology systems, uh, still a very great property, had record earnings this year, uh, record months in June and July, uh, but we are spending significant amounts of capital upgrading the technology system there uh, to make the experience better for consumers. Sounds like Southwest uh, could be a candidate here for some improvement. Uh, where, where, David, do you see when you look across the landscape of companies that could go private or valuations that have crumbled to a level at which a lot of people say private equity could be a major buyer this year of some of these distressed firms? Could you give us some hints of what might be in the pipeline, kinds of companies, places, uh, sectors we should be focused on? Sure. So, you know, we do buyouts, so buying mainly public companies, uh, carve-out transactions, things like buying Yahoo from Verizon or buying the Venetian from Las Vegas Sands. And then we do deleveraging transactions. You know, you may call them distressed. This is helping companies that are over-levered convert essentially debt to equity and deleverage their balance sheet. If I think about the themes for 2023 and really beyond, you know, we've moved from a world that was awash in cheap capital, and you have a chart up on your screen that, shown, uh, that shows the spike in M&A volumes in 2021, that's been highly correlated with record amounts of cheap capital. That was, in retrospect, the peak of, uh, of the bubble in cheap capital. And you're, now you're seeing capital become much more harder to come by and much more expensive. And you're seeing deal volumes come down both in traditional M&A and in LBO. So I think the theme for us and where we're focused is on opportunities where we could buy a great company at what now is what we think is a great price, right. and we could get that deal done where we could finance it. And creative financing... I think is going to be the name of the game for 2023. The other big opportunity, and that's going to be for 2023 and beyond, is deleveraging capital. So if you think about it, we've had essentially 10 years of negative real interest rates in America, and real interest rates are very correlated uh, with defaults. And therefore, we've had very, very, very low defaults for the last 10 years. We have so many companies uh, that had their capital structures designed 
for a world where capital was fundamentally cheaper and it was much more plentiful than it is currently. And those, these are companies that are going to be over levered, right. that are never going to grow really into their capital structures. And this is not going to play out like in 2020 and in the uh, GFC crisis, where it was like the world was ending and there was this quick, you know, mm -hmm. scary moment in time where businesses needed to deleverage. You know, my belief is that this is going to play out over really the next two to four years. And you're going to have companies that are just going to reach the end of their maturity runway and they're going to need to deleverage because the market's just unwilling and unable to continue to finance these companies sure. to the level that they were previously financed.